Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about mergers and monopolization, because when two companies love each other, they get together and screw over the consumer. Now let's get started with 1904's Northern Securities Co. vs. United States. This was your classic case of mustache twirling railroad barons in an early 20th century length competition. In this case, two railroad companies were in competition over the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy railroads because it was the early 20th century and nothing was ever going to make the railroad obsolete. James Hill, the largest stockholder for the Great Northern Railway, had partnered with J.P. Morgan, who owned the Northern Pacific Railway, to jointly buy the Chicago-based railroad section. Now, being cut out of any deal, Edward Harrington of the Union Pacific Railroad and Southern Pacific Railroad started buying up stocks to push Hill out of power. Now, while this didn't work, it succeeded in wasting everybody a lot of money as Hill had to buy more stocks, causing the New York Stock Exchange to explode. Hill and Morgan ultimately did get control of the Chicago Railroad, which scared everybody across America because this immediately was one of the largest companies in the world and monopolized cross-country travel. At the time, it would have been like if Facebook decided to merge with the entire internet. Because of this, the merger was found to be unlawful and the company was forced to split up into three to independently managed zones that I'm sure didn't collude. Now they did re-merge in 1969, but at that point no one gave a damn. This brings us to 1905's Swift & Co vs United States. This case revolves around big meat. This was the time when America was a man's country. Teddy Roosevelt was our president, our big industries were beef and railroads, and we only lived to 35 because we were tough. Anyways, in this case, America's big six meat producers got together into a beef trust that controlled half of the nation's market and three quarters of the market in New York. They were artificially raising prices and using their control to push out competition that didn't go along. This led the government to use newly implemented interstate commerce rules to break up, or dare I say, tenderize the meat packers. This brings us to 1911 Standard Oil Co. of New Jersey vs. United States, where the Sherman Antitrust Act decided to strike down one of the most corrupt entities in New Jersey since Chris Christie. To not make it onto Trump's cabinet, that's a pretty low bar to limbo your way under. Anyways, Standard Oil Co. Standard Oil was the whole package with people working in oil exploration, oil extraction, and they even had service stations. They also owned almost all of the oil refining companies in America and were quickly either crushing or acquiring their competition. This case introduced us to the rule of reason approach to interpreting the Sherman Antitrust Act. Before this point, our justice system used per se interpretations of antitrust laws, which meant that this is the law and if you break it, you're in big trouble, such as price fixing. But this new rule of reason law looked at the context of the size of the entity and used that to determine whether otherwise legal things that the company did could be considered illegal based on their scale. It's kind of hard to say when someone becomes a monopoly versus just a really big company. But the argument here was that a monopoly is only a monopoly if its effect is to unreasonably restrain trade. Which, in this case, it was ruled that Standard Oil was doing, resulting in that company being broken up into different competing firms. In the same month, the Supreme Court was deciding on 1911's United States vs. American Tobacco Co. And let me tell you, it was not a good month to be a large company. Using the same logic as Standard Oil Co., American Tobacco was found to be restricting trade by becoming a monopoly and broken up into four different companies. In a departure from the Standard Oil case where this breakup actually worked, these four companies maintained a polyamorous relationship and three of the four companies in 1938 were charged with continuing to operate an oligopoly. And that kind of feels so for that fourth cigarette company that didn't get invited to the party. Now we get to the knowledge of the Clayton Act of 1914 that really strengthened the Sherman Antitrust Act by turning some of those rule of reason ideas into per se laws. For example, it addressed price discrimination, 
which I realize immediately sets off sirens in people's heads because they picture blacks at a different water fountain. Price discrimination refers to the acts of charging different people different prices for a good. For example, adult and child movie ticket prices or student discounts. Now don't go suing your local movie theater citing the Clayton Act because this only forbids it if it lessens competition or creates a monopoly. It also forbids that sales from one company forbid purchases from a different company or can only use that product provided by that company, but only when that reduces competition. Although you would be hard pressed to think of a time when that wouldn't reduce competition. Mergers that significantly reduce competition and one person being the president of multiple entities was also forbidden if either of those reduced competition. Next we see ourselves in 1944's United States vs Alcoa. History buffs probably note that this is the height of World War II and Alcoa was in the virgin aluminum business, so business for them was quite literally booming. The problem in this case was that everyone acknowledged that Alcoa was a monopoly, but they weren't being jerks about it and to the court's knowledge hadn't done anything illegal to obtain that title. The question here was, is being a monopoly alone a crime? When this case went to the Supreme Court, the justices essentially looked at each other and said, I don't know, and sent it to the US Court of Appeals of the Second Circuit where it was overseen by a man whose name was Justice Learned Hand. And I can't think of a more perfect career path for a man named a Learned Hand to go into. In this case, the Department of Justice argued that it didn't matter how the monopoly came to be. The fact that Alcoa could control prices and competition made it per se illegal. On the other hand, Alcoa was arguing that they had plenty of competition from scrap and recycled aluminum dealers. But this was the big old World War II and America wasn't cheaping out and buying recycled brand aluminum. This case led to Learned Hand deciding that being a monopoly on its own was a per se crime and to declare a government divestiture from the company. Although in 1947 Alcoa successfully appealed the divestiture citing that Reynolds and Kaiser had entered the virgin aluminum market and everything went back to normal. This brings us to the incredibly low stakes yet funny case of 1951's Lorraine Journal Company vs United States. <sighs> Take a deep breath. This is a fun one. Taking place in the city of Lorraine, Ohio, in this city there was a conflict brewing just below the surface. You had the local newspaper, the Lorraine Journal, and you had the local radio station, both fighting tooth and nail for the hearts and minds of some 50,000 residents. The journal was published daily and reached 99% of Lorraine's population, or more accurately, 98% of their trash cans. The FCC licensed out a radio station WEOL to start broadcasting in that town, but by god if the Lorraine Journal was going to give up an inch of their influence. A scheme was devised where any advertiser who bought time on WEOL would not be sold advertising in Lorraine's journal. The district court found this local newspaper to be violating the Sherman Antitrust Act, so they appealed to the Supreme Court, which also found it to be violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. This case did have something interesting though because it was the first time the Sherman Antitrust Act was applied to a non-interstate business. This brings us to 1963's United States vs Philadelphia National Bank. At this time the Philadelphia National Bank was looking to merge with the Girard Trust Corn Exchange Bank and who would have guessed that the Corn Exchange Bank was a titan of industry. If the two banks merged, they would together control almost two billion dollars in assets, which by day standard sounds like the amount a banker might spend on a coat rack. But back in the day that meant that within the Philadelphia metropolitan area, they would combine to 36% of the area's bank's total assets, 36% of deposits, and 34% of net loans, which is not good. Now the case was the first time section 7 of the Clayton Antitrust Act that said the merger or acquisition that led to a severe drop in competition or a monopoly couldn't go through was applied to commercial banking and banks have been perfect ever since. Next to 1964 is United States vs Continental Can Co. That's right, the United States finally got up the confidence to take Big Can down a notch. 
This was another case where Section 7 of the Clayton Antitrust Act was applied. Except in this case, Continental Can, the second largest maker of metal cans, acquired Hazel Atlas Glass, the third largest maker of glass containers, which would have shaken up the entire container industry, thought nobody, as this case was dismissed by both the NYC District Court and the Supreme Court, citing that there were three different types of containers, glass, metal, and beer and that the government had failed to produce enough evidence to prove lack of competition. In 1966's FTC vs. Dean Foods Co., something major happened. Two of the largest Chicago dairy producers were in talks to join forces, and together they would control 23% of Chicago's milk. Now that might not sound like a lot, but that meant they would have been monopolizing milk deliveries in that area, because apparently that was a thing. The case here was not directly related to monopolies though, but whether the Federal Trade Commission could obtain a preliminary injunction before a merger took place. Now I realize I just said a lot of complicated sounding things, but the basic idea is, can the FTC burst into a merger session like it's the marriage scene from a rom-com and yell out, STOP THIS MERGER! Now this stop would be temporary until the FTC finishes an investigation, but it could turn into a permanent merger ban if the results are found to be too monopolistic. Much to this may of Dean's Foods, it was found that the FTC can preliminary break up a merger. For all you sports fans out there, this next one's for you. Robertson vs National Basketball Association This was the Supreme Court ruling that created free agents. The system used to be that, during a college draft, you got picked by a team and that was your team. When nowadays, you can have people like LeBron James who go from city to city like a big talker in the Witness Protection Agency. It was agreed that NBA rules restricted players' movements violating antitrust laws, because in an allegory as close to slavery as you can get, the individual players were products who needed a fair marketplace for exchange. For example, only one person can own Kobe Bryant, so he should be fairly traded. Yes, viewing people as a commodity is generally not the most ethical thing, but hey, in this case it got people more flexibility and raises. This brings us to 1993's Sports Spectrum Inc. vs McQuellen. In this case, Sports Spectrum owned the patent for a polymer they used in athletic goods. When they switched distributors, their old distributor refused to sell the right to produce using that polymer because apparently they hadn't heard of a patent before. Claiming they had violated Sherman Antitrust Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act, and every other piece of legislation with the word of antitrust in it, the distributor took them to court to see what would stick. Turns out, none of it did, as the Supreme Court ruled that there was insufficient evidence and attempts at becoming a monopoly in a catch-22 scenario are only illegal if you succeed. Now to our final case of the night, 2000's Frazier vs Major League Soccer. This was a Supreme Court case filed by 8 different soccer players. Hey, they could almost start their own team, suing the MLS for being the only soccer provider in America. Much like the NBA case, players here were arguing that there were salary caps and a lack of competition for players. Although, having a monopoly on soccer in America is like having a monopoly on pork in Israel. In this case, much like your standard soccer match, the players did not score any points, with the MLS asserting that they faced competition internationally from Europe, Latin America, and several other soccer, er, in this case, football, teams. And it was revealed that each of the players suing had, at some point, worked for one of these other leagues. So that's how we got to our current laws regarding mergers and monopolies. Join us next week when we're making a complete 180 and talking about the Supreme Court's history of separation of church and state. Hey internet, if you enjoyed this episode of Supreme Court Saturday and don't want to miss future videos, please help me secure advertisers by clicking the subscribe button below and clicking the like button. We have some more of our Supreme Court Saturday videos from our playlist here. If you're a podcast listener and you'd like to hear my library of over 50 podcasts, click the link below to go to my podcast site and subscribe. Thank you, and as always, that's all I have to say about that.